Hey, everybody. Thanks for showing up tonight. I'm Joe Macheda. I'm the Civic Arts Coordinator for Burning Man. I'm going to start with a little brief kick over to Christopher Breedlove, who runs um, our global activation team. He's going to tell you a little bit about just this new venture and then kick it, kick it back to me and I'll, I'll go from there. Cool. Thanks, Joe. Hey, everybody. My name is Christopher Breedlove. Um, and like I said, I work with Joe um, around the civic activation teams at Burning Man. And just a real quick kind of intro uh, to why we're doing this call today is right now we're exploring in a lot of ways, um, different ways that we can expand out and talk about what's happening across the different Burning Man networks in different ways. And it's not only about how to talk about things in different ways, but it's also to really kind of reach across the aisles of the different kind of worlds of Burning Man, which is sometimes BWB or theme camps or volunteer teams, and having larger conversations around these things. And so there's going to be six of these. The idea is that we want to do one every other week, kind of around a different subject area. And so I'm really thankful for, to Joe for uh, choosing to be our first experiment in this for art activation. And we plan on having conversations around community activation, civic activation, ecosystem activation, and event activation. And so that's kind of the idea. And you know, you guys are all here for the first experiment. And I'm really excited because we have some great guests. So Joe, you know, take it away and thanks for being brave and doing this. Awesome, thanks Christopher. Yeah, no um, better guinea pig than art people. We like to do weird stuff. Um, so again, thank you all for being here. This is our first time trying this. We're really interested in your feedback and um, using this platform for the community to share about what you're interested in doing and to learn from each other. Um, so give us your ideas. I'm gonna share a little bit more about that, where you can, uh, how we can connect after the event. Um, but we'd love to hear um, what you think of this and what you'd like to see more of. Um, that leads me to introducing Sage Bandicoot, who is going to be managing all of our questions. She'll filter them up to me and I'll try to get as many answered as we can. Um, Sage, if you wanna say anything or just wave. Hi guys, I'm Sage Bandicoot. Joe pretty much covered it, but thank you all for being here. Thanks for being here, Sage. Um, what else do I have for you? Nothing, we're gonna get right into it. This is, um, this is round one. Um, I'm going to first start with Rabu Engineering. The principals of Rabu are Celinda Mar Martinez and Ali Lahajanan. Oh, I knew I was going to flub it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working on that all day. That's a tough one. Uh, um, so these are two amazing people. They have been engineers um, for a lot of our favorite art projects that have gone to VRC, and they also engineer for the man itself. I've had the pleasure of working with them for a number of projects around the Bay Area. Um, they've also collaborated with our other speakers at Building 180. So I'm gonna let Ali and Celinda take it away. Hey, thanks, Joe. Thanks for the, the really warm welcome. And hi, everybody. Um, I'm Celinda. And I'm just gonna give you a little bit more information about Rabu for those of you who aren't familiar with us. Um, Ali and I started Rubu six years ago in 2014. We'd actually been engineering art pieces before that. We've engineered, our, our the very first one was Bliss Dance, who's right here, um, the 45 foot tall sculpture of a naked woman dancing on one foot. And from there, we, that, yeah, she was debuted in 2010. And from there, we have just been doing engineering on the side and, and then realized really quickly that there was a strong need for engineering art pieces actually. And so we were really happy to fill in those gaps since it's something that we're really passionate about and really love doing. And um, since then, in the six years, we've become a team of five engineers with one um, in turn, we've engineered over a hundred sculptures that range between six and a hundred feet tall. As Joe mentioned, we've been lucky enough to engineer the man base since 2017 and have worked on a couple temples as well. We work on a lot of public art pieces all around the country and um, we just try to do our best job of assisting artists in whichever way we can. So um, it's been a really beautiful journey these past six years. And, uh, and, and, uh, 
first COVID hit, which add, on that, I'll pass the reins over to Ali to let you know how COVID has affected us and what we've done in response. Yeah, hello everyone, uh, Ali. Um, I'm honored to be here and talking to you all. This is, this is amazing. Um, so yeah, we all been hit by COVID. Uh, I remember we were, I was flying back from um, Colorado for a site visit and then I, I was in the airplane and I saw people wearing masks. I'm like, what? I thought we were not supposed to wear masks. I thought we were the mask for health workers. And I came back and two days later, everything got shut down, all events. And then all our projects also got shut down and got on pause. So there was that moment of reality hitting that what did I do? Like what's happening? Um, so as every day was going on, we were emotional roller coaster for all of us in at Reboot. So one of the things I think like, yeah, is a, is a horrible thing that has happened, but looking at Brightside, there are some good things that came out of it too. So one of the good thing was that at Reboot, we decided to do one hour, half an hour call at the beginning to just talk about COVID, our feelings, how, how, how are we doing? And then we realized that half an hour was not enough. So we ended up doing an hour call and we go, go around the circle and we talk about our feeling and emotion. And it was really interesting how all of us would go through roller coasters. Like one week I was panicking, like I couldn't breathe and some other week, some other person. So it was, it was very interesting. And we were uh, actually brought us very close together. Um, we do now on a regular basis, the COVID fun talks to just kind of, we, you know, we changed the name. So it makes us feel a little bit more playful as we all Bernie when people do play with names to make things a little bit easy to digest. Um, yeah, so then, so we do 10 minutes, 15 minutes of meditation every day. Then we talk about emotions and feelings. And now we're also talking about design. So we're really honored and happy that this came to life. And then we were talking and we realized, okay, so what do we want to do as a company? Uh, how do we, we want to see the change. They say you, you should be the change you want to see in the world. And then we, we were like, okay, we should give back. We should figure out how we can do this. So we came up with the Rubu Gives Back program um, to give back to, to our community of artists. And, um, and that was a, a very um, effective effort that um, we ended up getting 80 applications from artists and we realized how this has affected our community and how serious this is. Um, so that was a very uh, eye-opening sort of move and which I, I suppose we can get into it more later if you're all interested. Um, so yeah, and also then after COVID, Black Lives Matter movement gained more momentum, which as a person of color, I'm pretty happy about it, to be honest, um, to, to talk about these things more openly. Um, so yeah, we've done also a bunch of uh, work in that area as well, uh, in social media. And um, to, honestly, we have a few artists that are Slack, and we sent our questions to them. And there are questions that I, I, we could talk about them later, but we are still also we want to know more about this movement and we want to understand how we can get involved. So if you all have any input for us, please let us know. All right, Joe, I'll pass that to you. Thanks, Ellie. Uh, all right, we're gonna kick it to Meredith now from Building 180. Meredith is one half of the, uh, the partnership of Building 180. We're missing Shannon Riley, one of the other founders, but um, she was uh, unfortunately had to, to do a, deal with some uh, family issues. But yeah, Building 180, they have been putting art all over the world for the last, what is it, three years now? Three or four, four three, about, yeah. Yeah, we met um, actually project managing for Peter Hudson on Playa and uh, have kept up ever since. You've done a number of, of projects and commissions managed um, across the world and now have pivoted to supporting um, artists during COVID and Black Lives Matter. I'm just gonna let you take it from here. <laughs> hey everyone, uh, and thanks Joe. 
Yes, as Joe mentioned, uh, Building 180 has been putting art around the world for about four years. We got our start with Burning Man at a place called Building 180, which was on Treasure Island, which is where Peter Hudson and Marco Cochran and Katie Boynton and a lot of other artists had their studio space. Um, and that's where Shannon, Riley and myself met each other, uh, both apprenticing under both Peter and Marco as volunteers. Um, and we both kept seeing like artists have their sculptures in the corner of warehouses and was just so amazingly devastating that we wanted to spend our efforts of supporting artists and managing their work of like what could happen after Playa and how do you get these things that were so inspirational on Playa seen in the real world and also you know find a way to connect artists with other opportunities. Um, so you, we kind of used our business sense and our you know, managerial experience to help start managing artists, to connect them to clients that we had and get their work out there to pitch to people and yeah, really just kind of figure out ways to really support artists and manage their work. Um, we also run an artist in residency program in the South, uh, two of them in the South Bay and really are on a mission to help artists on Playa and off Playa. We sometimes project manage, you know, work as Joe said on Playa, and then we also will take pieces from Playa and help artists do the production off Playa too. So it's kind of a full gamut of doing public art, events, uh, interior design, people and clients come to us with a really wide array of, of needs, and then we, we help curate their experiences and, and execute the production for them. Um, it's been really rewarding and it's really fun working with amazing genius artists all the time um and yeah when covid kind of when covid hit we our jobs were also pretty paused obviously art is a afterthought for a lot of big budget projects and um, developments as, as i'm sure you guys are all aware and we wanted to put our efforts towards supporting artists and the one way we saw that happening was that there was a lot of boards uh going up on businesses in the bay area and with those boards, we thought about if we could if we could put murals onto the boards. So Building 180 partnered with a, a nonprofit called Art for Civil Discourse, and we started we launched a fundraiser so that we could accept funds through Intersection for the Arts to pay artists to paint murals on boarded storefronts uh, across the Bay Area. And to date, we've done just shy of a hundred murals in the Bay, um, which is under. I mean, in, in, in under four months. So uh, averaging about one mural a day. Um, and we are paying for artists for time and materials, um, modest stipends, but artists were really inspired to keep going out and to create work, which is really amazing. And it was, it's, it's a, San Francisco is a very difficult place to make public art. And there's a lot of red tape to make public art anywhere anyway, but just this kind of gave us a gateway to make an impact in, in, in the Bay without having to, kind of jump through all of these hoops and artists were really were really supported by the funds that we were able to provide and really inspired that they were able to create public art in a ways that they weren't able to do previously so um it was really exciting it's it's slowing down we're trying to ca we're thinking about capping the murals at 100 murals um but before we did that obviously there uh, the world has shifted quite a bit and black lives matter has come to the forefront which is an amazing opportunity to pivot and support artists and, and other organizations in ways that we didn't know how to before or that we weren't thinking about before. Um, and it's really humbling to know that we can do better and we've been wanting to do better and we are now diverting any other funds that we've gotten towards um, to center black artists and to center their narratives and voices during this time. Um, you know, focusing on uh, black owned businesses, black artists, uh, indigenous artists. And of course, there's the intersection of pride happening at the same time um, in June with with everything going on. And and how do you how do you support marginalized voices generally um, while centering black artists, too? It's been a really, again, rewarding and humbling experience just to be able to have conversations with people that you wouldn't normally wouldn't normally have and and we're we're extremely we're extremely humbled and um excited to be a part of the conversation to kind of move things into the next level uh one of the ways we've been doing that is by 
actually the Burning Man camp, the Boz bus had reached out. They were very instrumental in doing uh, and using the bus during uh, Black Lives Matter's protests. So we partnered with them to, you know, do ma matched funding to fund black artists and trans and queer artists to paint the bus and then also use the matching to be able to fund organizations in Oakland, um, such as Endeavors, who is the activism arm of Good Mother Gallery in Oakland. Uh, and they were behind the big Black Lives, Mur black Lives Matter mural in Oakland, um, and also with queer arts um, for the all black trans lives matter around Lake Merritt. So kind of diverting funds without using our platform for good as a challenge without like centering ourselves. So we're, we're really, um, open to exploring how to do that better with with just being facilitators as opposed to like centering ourselves so um we're we're here to support artists and people of color and black artists and really know that we can do better and here we are love it thanks meredith um i think both rabu and building 180 have some images of work that they've supported for the COVID relief and Black Lives Matter. I don't know if we want to go through those at the same, like before we kind of roll through questions. Um, also, if folks want to put questions into the chat, um, Sage is going to be filtering those to me as well. Um, I don't know, Meredith, do you want to keep going a little bit? And it's just since you're hot off of the <laughs> <laughs> your spiel and just show like at least the late Merit mural. Oh, sure. Yeah, so I have it actually. Um, let me share my screen. Let's see. This was the this is the mural that we helped to fund with through Boz. And again, this was with Queer Arts running the production of this mural and Endeavors from Good Mother Gallery doing the full production in collaboration with Queer. Um, queer Arts in Oakland, and it reads all Black, trans, queer, non-binary, women's, disabled, imprisoned, lives matter. So a really beautiful statement. Um, and again, don't want to like be, take credit for any of this is really that we wanted to fund organizations, which is something that we're, we're exploring and doing to raise the money via our platform, which has gained so much traction. Um, we gained, we fundraised over $80,000 to do the murals in, in the Bay Area. And yeah, putting that money towards goods to, to organizations that are already doing this work on the ground is really important to us as we don't want to, we don't want to be, we don't need to lead, lead everything. We can just pass it off to people who know what they're doing already um, and give them the chance to kind of run with the things that they know how to do best. Um, you know, so we're, we, we want to see ourselves as facilitators in this movement and not center ourselves in this movement. Um, and that can be by the connections that we have or the funding that we are able to raise and you know just extending that to people who need it for projects that are really worthwhile such as this one um, we're also doing some collaborations with east oakland to do a mural um, in our food desert area that will be called soul park uh, paying artists to do a big mural there which will be a community mural as well um, and I can kind of flip backwards to this is the Boz bus, of course. Um, and this is Matley Hurd on the right, who is a black artist who painted a beautiful mural in Oakland after the protest started. And on the left is a photo from uh, Endeavor's Instagram page, which is showing their Black Lives Matter mural. Um, but yeah, we're really humbled and grateful to be able to have these conversations with people. Um, I have been curious about structurally your choice, um, building 180 is a for-profit um, yes. company, and then you pivoted for Paint the Void to create a 501c3, correct? Uh, our for civil discourse is the 501c3 that we partnered with, um, so we were able to accept funds through through that organization and their relationship with Art for Civil Discourse, or excuse me, with Intersection for the Arts, who is their fiscal sponsor. Um, and then Building 180 has the production experience to be able to you know, mobilize artists on the ground and make sure that they have the correct you know, legal paperwork and insurance covering. And uh, it was really a way for us to be able to accept funds and be able to funnel them quickly to artists. Um, as a for-profit company, you can't really accept larger donations or grant money from a lot of organizations. They, they need the tax write-off, so for us, 
it was pretty crucial to be able to partner with someone to be able to raise and accept money. Right. And for those that don't understand fiscal sponsorship, can you explain a little bit more, like the tax benefits of that? Yeah. So the fiscal sponsorship, they take a they take a fee from the any money raise. It, Intersection takes a ten percent fee, and that's to do all the administration of paperwork. As a nonprofit, you have to have everything reported really down to a T, and they take care of all of the administrative work and also cut the checks that go to the artists as well. Um, so it's just, it's a matter of like having support for being able to accept money through the 501c3 and then they help divert the funds and, um, you know, kind of hold the money into a, a in a safe bank um, to distribute like it within the, within the means of, or legalities of having a 501c3. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little bit more about like building 180's reputation and your connections were what was, were part of what made it easy to, to raise the funds as a pass, pass through, right? Um, well, I mean, again, like this partnership was really crucial for the fundraising. I think that where we were really instrumental was that we have a lot of the network connections for um, artists. So, I mean, before we even started, before we partnered with Art for Civil Discourse, we actually were doing murals with artists and they wanted to make all of the art for free. Um, and, you know, that's not really what our ethos of our company is or what the ethos of the project is. It's it really was like, we want to support artists. Um, and learning a lot about space politics in that too is that as Black Lives Matter started and the protests started to shift, we didn't want to just give walls to people who are privileged enough to paint them um, because I think that that in itself is this inherent form of privilege to be able to paint a wall for free with no money as an artist is a is an extreme privilege and so you know we are we really about adamant about paying artists um, and making sure that you know people are at least compensated to some degree for their work. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, Felix is asking if anyone's having audio problems. Can people hear okay? How are we doing? I think I we'll hear. keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, well, we have some questions rolling in. Again, just um, like this is uh, less of a presentation and more of a conversation. So we're we're going to kind of roll with um, what people are interested in. So even if you don't have a really specific question but have a topic area, I was really kind of pushing the financial side because Building 180, I think, had a really um, interesting approach to um, being able to move quickly and nimbly and distribute funds. Um, yeah. so, but yeah, take us in any direction you want. And I've got a question from Steven. Where did my questions go? Hey, I was just curious, um, if y'all have a map out of the mural locations. We do. You can go to paintthevoid.org is the site and there's a whole map section on the website. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, someone else is asking, how has the process of finding artists during COVID and BLM happened? Has it been harder to find artists to work with? Well, we, ha we had a lot of intake forms. So we created forms via Google that we distributed via the, f the, via the fundraising page and via our network so that people who actually wanted to participate would sign up that way, um, both for it kind of, you know, it was a learning experience. At first, we weren't asking questions about gender or race or sexual orientation. And obviously, people don't have to answer those questions. But in terms of finding artists wanting to support um, different marginalized communities and, and artist communities, those questions are really kind of crucial for us to understand who those people are and identify those people so that we can work with them. Um, but yeah, we distributed just via forms and, and word of mouth. And, and then the selection process for um, you know, artists were shortlisted and then, and also by, by the merit of their work and also by the neighborhood proximity that they lived in. So we did our very best to try to match businesses with artists that were in their own neighborhoods. That was especially crucial in the beginning when, you know, things were really scary and we didn't want to encourage any unnecessary travel. Um, so yeah, most of the artists are pretty hyper local to where they are living and that uh, was a, a big factor in how we put, put artists and businesses together. I wanna do a similar question for um, Rabu to get you guys back in here. I know you extended your deadline or you, you reopened the call for artists. Um, I 
believe was somewhat in light of um, what was happening with Black Lives Matter? Did that have an effect on your process? Um, well, I wouldn't say that it really had an effect on our process, but we saw that there was a really strong need for artists. Artists needed support during this time of COVID and, and a lot of the art projects being halted and shut down or paused indefinitely. And um, so when we did our call, we had, a, it was a month long process to accept applications. And we, in that time, we received 80 applications. I think the hardest part was for us to go through all the applications and go through the, the projects and interview the artists and have face to face with everybody to really understand their stories, to really understand their art pieces so that we knew that we would be helping the people that really needed it the most. Um, just, <clears throat> just for you, those of you who don't know, the Rubu Gives Back program is it was a thirty thousand um, dollar engineering services offered um, to artists uh, who do uh, large scale art sculptures, and uh, we after we went through the applications, we it, it, as Selinda said, it was very difficult to choose the artists. It seemed like everyone was very affected, so we we increased our budget. Um, to accommodate more people. Um, then we also offer 20% discount for everyone else. So uh, we can help them still with their project because mo and most of the projects were had specific funding, but um, they were on pause and all the other projects that they had were canceled. So they could have used this fund to um, distribute it with, within their work. Mm -hmm. But it it was a very successful campaign. I'd say that we were able to connect with a lot of artists in this way that we hadn't um, had contact with before. We had people applying all over the world, actually. So um, it really showed us that there was a strong need for this and um, and because people were sharing it and it got to the right people. So it, because of that, it's really something that we feel strongly about doing again in the future. Um, um, we know that artists often are struggling regardless of whether COVID is happening or not. And so um, we really wanna do our part to, to, to help as much as we can. Also, Rubu gives back, this is the second round of it. The first round was that there was a sculpture in LA, uh, a coyote um, for immigrants that um, come to US and the coyote had a lot of information for the immigrants, uh, a lot of information that you would need as an immigrant to uh, exist in US. So they, uh, so we did that project as pro bono and this was the second time we activated it in a much larger scope because the need was um, brought. And the reason we extended it, um, the, the deadline was also people were emailing us. They were like, hey, we missed it. We missed the deadline. Is there any way we could apply or can we have more time? So that was also part of the reason that we extended the deadline. And yes, this is the first um, project that we did as Revu gives back the, the coyote. Um, and we're really proud of it. And we will be doing more uh, of Revu gives back. Mm -hmm. Um, the other, the projects that we did select for the, this round of Rabu Gives Back are, are these ones right here. And so um, in the top left corner, this project is called Neighbors. It's two house-like structures that will be, could, they will be like the, a downtown for uh, Terre Haute, Indiana, which um, is a, an area that's really struggling financially, economically, and health-wise. Um, so we feel really, we're just really proud to be giving back to that community. This piece is really cool because these structures actually pivot and they open up. And so we're going to be um, posting a video pretty soon about um, showing how this, how this works, but it will create this kind of like downtown effect or it's actually reprogrammable so that the city can have different types of events and they can change the way the structures look depending on, um, on what the event's needs are. Um, the artist is actually uh, giving, a, giving a lot of his time and energy to this because the, the project doesn't, it has a very minimal funding. So we felt that our contribution here would be immense. So um, that was, this is our 
number one sort of uh, the biggest granted or that we um, gifted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We run through a few more. I'd love to just get a little like overview. Yeah. Have, is it nine projects? There's um, there's seven total. Oh. Um, we're showing six because the seventh one is a relationship that we're building with Desert X, which is something we're really excited about as well. And they're a nonprofit, Desert X, and we are really proud to be connected with them as well. Awesome. Yeah. And, and they've been hit hard by COVID, and they're just what they're doing is so cool of bringing public art to. Um, to the Coachella Valley. And um, so we're really proud to, to provide them some consulting services. Um, um, but some of the other projects we have, a, this project right here is zoomed in because it's, um, it's, uh, it's semi-confidential, but they were okay with us posting about this. It's going to be going, uh, it's a piece for uh, a NASA uh, center. Um, and uh, then we and we're all engineers, so NASA is like our mecca as nerds. <laughs> so we were really excited to, to do something for NASA, especially because they were hit so hard. It was an art um, fabrication company. And again, like all their projects, as we talk to more and more artists and, uh, and organization, we realized that we all have been hit really hard. Um, and we all need help. So that, that was another reason that this piece was chosen. Um, this piece on the right, the one that's it's like a, a giant, it is being done by a, um, a professor um, in, in Massachusetts. And um, he employs his students to help him with his pieces. It's also a very low budget project and it's gonna be going into their downtown area. This, um, we have a Pegasus coming up into Santa Rosa. We're really working hard to uh, bring more work to the public space um, and, and just kind of have that kind of art presence in their downtown area. Yeah, it's going to Redwood City downtown. And when we, we, um, we interviewed the um, art commissioning, if you will, he is the one who, he was the one who applied, not the artist. And he was saying that if we don't pretty much get the engineering uh, in a pro bono fashion, we will not be able to uh, pull this project. So we felt like, okay, if you're not involved, this project will not happen. So that was uh, very exciting for us to be able to have such a high impact. Awesome. We're also working with uh, James Moore, who, or, who he makes these um, aluminum, uh, uh, kind of robot looking structures. They're really cool. And this is going to be a series of them. He's a black artist and does fantastic work in um, here in our home area in California. And um, so this piece is going to be, uh, I think like seven different robots playing with each other. And it's a piece that's really about inclusivity of all beings. Yeah, it's called Playing Together, and it shows the ball passing through. Um, and that's that's why he has also a person in wheelchair, um, because inclusivity, we shouldn't forget that we all can play together and be, you know, having fun um, without forgetting about each other. Mm -hmm. And then um, lastly, we're working with Hibi Kozo, who um, is big part of the Burning Man community. They have a couple projects going up and they've been hit really hard by COVID. Um, a lot of their projects have been canceled or postponed. Um, so we're helping them with two projects. One is going in downtown Sacramento, um, which is what this image here on the right is for. And then there's going to be another one that um, looks a little bit different than this. It's going to be going to the US Embassy in Turkey. Um, and there isn't very much funding available for, um, for either of them. And we're happy to be uh, a, part of, a part of those projects. Amazing. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few questions. They're, I'm not asking in order, so nobody panic. We've got you all down. But um, what college is the Massachusetts project affiliated with? Uh, let, me, let me find out. And then we have just a few questions that I think um, are applicable to Building 180 and 
Rupu, um, while you're looking that up, Celinda, how are you? How are you connected to the southeast region of the U.S. and the burner community here? And how can we be more connected to support our community and artists in the south? Um, that's a big one. Um, I, I honestly have not done much work in the southeast of the U.S. I've done, you know, we've we've, we've helped with some Art Basel things, and I know there's a burner community in Miami. Um, that being said, I think that there's a lot of tools that you know, we can provide to start initiatives um, similar to Paint the Void in, for instance, is this something that it's, it's, it's really replicatable um, and it's something that can be done really anywhere. Uh, for instance, I, myself and my teammates for Paint the Void mostly orchestrated all of the murals remotely. Um, I was, I actually have only seen a handful of them still to this day. When I was in quarantine, I was stuck in upstate New York um, so yeah, I think that that's a really empowering thing to know that you can create art in your own city from afar and, you know, I'd be happy to tell you like the kind of the keys and the steps we took to do this, which ended up being to, you know, connecting with our local communities and it really took a lot of outreach and there's some, you know, finer details in terms of like legalities of insurance and paperwork and things that to protect yourselves um, but it's so it's super it's super possible to do this elsewhere and I, i'd be super happy to kind of share some of those some, some of those tools with you there's a similar question um is there any possibility just really quick that was the college of charleston awesome oh, and i see the comment that it was the deep south um and i, I that's that's amazing and definitely would love to continue to, to have a conversation and also just just i think that the importance of art in communities that don't see this type of art is super empowering and super impactful um, and figuring out ways to show that there are artists of all different colors and sexual orientations and things like that is really amazing for people who are in those communities to see that there are that there are artists that look like them or, or are like them making art and that you can make art is some is something that's really amazing and I think impactful and figuring out ways to engage those communities with artists is something I'd love to explore. Um, I'm really interested just seeing all of the, the monuments being torn on. This is just bringing off of the Deep South um, comment. Do any of you have ideas on or just thoughts on what it takes to propose new um, sculptures, how to deal with um, bureaucracy, different governments, how to get your um, your proposal docs in line. What are things that people would be wanting to respond to um, what's going on right now? Um, how might pe how might artists um, start to address those issues with their their projects? I mean that's a great question. I think that uh, it, getting their idea so it's that uh, how do you get your idea or a sculpture placed through the city um, is a very complex pro uh, process uh, as they typically do RFP or RFQ request for proposal. Um, and for that, you need to put together application and your idea. And typically your idea means bringing your vision to a 3D um, rendering world, uh, whatever that means. Uh, to you, to you or your capability as an artist. Um, so the, the process is a little bit intense, but um, ultimately you fill out an application that required. They want to see your past work. They want to see your team. They want to see if you have thought about your engineering and do you have someone in, in mind for that? Um, so we can, I, we have done some RFP and RFQs. Um, if, anyone is interested to know more or is uh, passionate about placing a sculpture, um, please do reach out to us and talk to us. Um, we can also be included in your team as the engineer to give more credibility in terms of the fact that we could do, um, you could pull off large scale art sculptures. Um, so yeah, talk to us. And kind of to, to piggyback on that too, is that, you know, Building 180 does the production for those sculptures. We work really closely with Rubo all the time um, as our engineers and, 
and then building 180 handles the production side of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you are wanting to make a big sculpture and need support in that way, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid though. Uh, all you need is a great yeah. idea. We got your back. Yeah, and every jurisdiction is different. So um, some will be more stringent than others. Uh, some will be very lax about, about it and depends on the size as well. So yeah, I mean, that we'd be, all of us I think here on the board would be happy to chat with you more about it if you have an idea. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, another question is, is there a possibility to collaborate with South American artists some way? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we would love to. Um, we'd love to collaborate with, uh, with anybody who's interested in building artwork. So um, yeah, I'd love to hear what you have in mind. So feel free to reach out to us. Also put your name in our sign up sheet. <laughs> Um, I'm just curious if you're seeing with so many pauses and cancellations, um, if, if you have any sense, um, in your crystal balls of, from the field of, you know, what opportunities might be arising out of, um, you know, as a result of lots of these pauses. Uh, that's a really good point, Joe. I think that I personally believe, or uh, believes that uh, art sculptures are gonna what's gonna heal, heal people uh, we are all affected by this crisis and we need more monumental structures to show that we're all together we're doing we're all supporting each other and when i look at art sculptures there's something about it that uh, it gives me the goosebumps and it makes me feel like we're all connected we are a community and we bring everyone to, nowadays like when you're walking on the street you're trying to avoid people or everyone is wearing masks there's that gap between people and uh these art sculptures i think are the solution to bring people together to bring that joy that we're still strong and standing awesome. yeah i think that there's definitely I, I mean, I, I think that we have the same idea that art can be this really empowering thing. And I think people are starting to be more creative and start to realize like how important art is a role in, in our well being. And, you know, particularly from quarantine, of realizing like what would you have done without art in some form uh, and realizing like how important art is. And as we go back to work and go back to daily lives, like people are going to be fearful and, and scared and unsure. And, um, you know, environments can be, don't, you don't want your environment to be really sterile. So I think that there will be a rise of, of art coming back in terms of sculptures that are outside and also like the way that we design interiors and um, how you in putting art in, in interiors to like make people feel some sense of safety and some sense of vibrancy in an otherwise like pretty scary world in a pretty sterile environment. Uh, and I, I think that there will be, I think that people will be as much as they're are able to put more stock into art um, to kind of foster those new environments. I'm totally fascinated about like how RFPs are going to evolve or what um, conditions people are going to be looking for 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 new commissions. So I'm excited to see what come what creativity comes in response to those RFPs, and I think there's going to be a lot of creativity involved in um, what's being asked of them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, based on my understanding, the budget for the art, uh, civic art has been set for the following two years. So, but there is the fear that due to the uh, reduced taxpayer, um, that we will be seeing less public art uh, after two years. So I'm hoping that wouldn't be the case, but um, that's something that is on the horizon that we should all be conscious of. Mm -hmm. Do you see any potential for a pivot or like, you know, if artists, if you want to inspire some creativity now of what might be a creative pivot for um, developing public art that's not in the same vein of what traditional RFPs look like? That's a curveball. You don't have That's to a really good question. I think that what Burning Man has taught us is that we don't need anyone. We can all come together and do it ourselves and we can fund it. We can, we can, that's, that's how I see it. I see that we do fundraising program and we find public lands that are not occupied and 
we do RFB and we review it ourselves and we all give back and make it happen. Amazing. That's like the bumper sticker moment, Ali. <laughs> <laughs> Doing it. I'm also curious, like, I know we can't talk too much about Desert X, but that already seems like a model where someone, you know, invented their own wheel and they're going with it. Yeah. I'd like to see more of that happening across the country or in South America, whoever asked that question. Um, we don't have many more coming in. I can keep asking my own unless um, you can put a hand up and we can also unmute you. This can go in any direction. We've got some badass um, folks from the field that want to talk about whatever you're interested in. It would be cool to do events based around the Burning Man guiding principles, sustaining ties to the question of global slavery and how that affects the environment. I agree, Alyssa. Mm -hmm. um, Roxy has a question for, um, what are some dr some of your wild dreams, Rabu, and Building 180, so that we can support you? Good one, Roxy. Yeah, thank you. One of my um, art uh, engineering fantasies is putting, well, first of all, putting ha having something that goes, goes to the Olympics something that I would be really excited about doing, but ultimately um, putting an art piece in space. <laughs> so, you know, if you've got any way to do that, uh, count us in, please. Uh, when you were reviewing the uh, application, I was, me and Selena were keep talking, I wish we had the power to do all these projects for free. I wish we had uh, some billionaire that this is peanuts for him, to mm -hmm. give us some money to, so we can help all these artists. Um, that was the, the dream that I had. What if we, we had an organization that could fund art fully? <laughs> that, that would be my dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being able to support all the artists. Yeah. So. Um, Anthony just said that he used to work for the Olympics. Feel free to unmute yourself if you've got more to share on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come contact you, Anthony. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, else? what about your wildest dreams? Oh, my wildest dreams? Um, I want to put more art into places where people don't have the opportunity to see it, and that would require a lot of uh, buy-in from probably outside outside people who don't have any other interests other than the fact that they want to see other art. Um, it's hard to put art into impoverished communities or places where that's not really taught or valued because there's not anyone to pay for it. Um, so yeah, like Ali was saying, that would be great to have someone who just could fund it all. But I do think that there's a way to do that, um, which is proven by kind of fundraising from fundraising, uh, it, which is a harder route, but I think that there's, I think that that would be one, that's definitely one of my, my passions is kind of revitalizing areas um, and kind of breathing some life into places that don't get to see art. Mm, I love awesome. that. It reminds me of um, where Space Whale was put in downtown Reno in an area that does have a lot of, uh, there, there are a lot of homeless people in that area. And so when Space Whale was put up, or maybe it was, um, or maybe it was Believe, but there was some art pieces installed in this area. And there was this homeless guy who came to Matt Schultz and was just thanking him from the bottom of his heart that he was able to just see that every day. It was so meaningful and beautiful to that person. And I think that that's something that just sticks with me. And I, um, just to know that it, ha it can have such a strong effect on, on people out there. Mm -hmm. We got another question that asked, and this could go for each of you, um, how would you characterize your politics? Are there clients you would not work with, themes you would not touch, or spaces you would not make art in? That's a good question. Um, I think acceptance is important, but uh, there are certain things that I think as a principle is important as well. Um, this Black Lives Matter movement has taught us that you're either with us or you're against us. So if we do see racism, we would surely be speaking out and we would not be working with those people. 
um, if they have art that is provoking in a sense that they're not supporting this movement, um, I think that we would be certainly against that. Um, so in terms of politics, do we, we accept everyone? Obviously there's a differences, but we won't have a conversation. Uh, but in terms of there are some red lines that um, we will not pass and racism is definitely one of them. Yeah, I, I think we couldn't support any any type of um, hateful type of art, um, but I would definitely be interested in having conversations with and if there was anybody who was wanting to produce that. I've never encountered any anybody that that is that that would. But if there if there was somebody, I would be interested in having conversations with them to try to. Well, it was an interesting, this person that from Rubu gives back, he contacted me, he did, his project didn't get accepted. And he was saying that he wants to make it um, sculpture out of all these sculptures that's being torn down, um, a giant one that there's humans are coming out of this ashes. And then his idea was great until he said, I think all lives matter. And then that's when something clicked in me and I had to have a really lengthy discussion with them. Um, so yes, there are times the, I mean, I, I haven't encountered it so many times. There's been maybe once or twice that I've heard at least comments, uh, which I don't think that he meant it the way he said it, uh, but it's important. I think it's our job to educate people. If you hear something that doesn't sound right or it's not right, we should definitely get engaged and talk to people and not just say, hey, yeah, that that guy say that, I don't really care. Again, you're either with us or against us kind of thing. Meredith, do you have any thoughts on projects that you would accept or, or not? Yeah, I think that there's, well, I think that there's, Definitely a line, as Ali is saying, too, that we wouldn't cross. I have not encountered having to make that decision. Um, I think that typically people who are wanting to fund and make art are, are, are usually a different type of person that supports artists and, um, and, and you know, voices and yeah, it's just a different type of person. So I think that they're, they don't intrinsically go hand in hand together. Um, I don't know exactly the lines. Of course, racism, racism is a line that we would draw. Uh, I think that anyone who is like pro-destruction of the environment is someone that we would um, is someone that we wouldn't necessarily work with. Uh, we have done a lot of environmental art and teaching about you know plastic recycling and and using reusing waste and things like that. So it would be kind of a total 180 for us to to work with someone who is pre 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 preaching like someone's views that are alternate to that. Um, but of course, I think that there are a variety of clients that we would not work with and, and potentially artists that we wouldn't work with too. Um, good question. I'm super excited for um, what we have ahead of us. I'm really appreciative to Rabu and Building 180 and uh, Christopher Breedlove for heading up this initiative. Sage, thank you so much for moderating the chat. And um, I'm really appreciative for all of you showing up. I can't wait to do more of these. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. thank you. Again, reach out if you have wild ideas and you want to chat with us. Feel free to reach out. Thank Same you, thing. everyone. Thank you.